Um, Ryan, thank you very much for your introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you this evening. We're very pleased to be associated with this particular uh, venture and very pleased that it started off here in Liberty Hall, which is kind of the iconic uh, building for the trade union movement in Ireland, not, not its natural headquarters, but I think in the, in the popular mind always regarded as such. It's the building from which the uh, proclamation in 1916 was printed uh, and from where the Citizen Army went off to the GPO. So it has a, a place in our history and you're very welcome here. Well, just to say that uh, the, the theme for what I, for the remarks that I want to make, I've uh, taken as uh, the title that there are no jobs on a dead planet and it's something that I've borrowed from the International Trade Union Confederation because this is the campaigning slogan that it has adopted in its preparations for the, the Paris uh, Climate Change Summit uh, starting at the end of November uh, next. And it's intended to emphasize that the future of work is actually acutely dependent on environmental sustainability. It is, in effect, a core issue for workers and for trade unions. However, in the reflection I want to share with you this evening, I want to draw not just on my experience as a representative of the labor movement as such, but also on perspectives I gained working in the field of international development over a number of years. But mostly though, I, I actually want to speak to you out of concern for my own grandchildren and the condition of the planet that we will bequeath to them and to their uh, generation. So when people speak of the need for a green industrial revolution, what do they really mean? Now according to Mariana Mazzucato, who writes quite interestingly on the whole question of uh, industrial structures and industrial policy, the basic premise is that the current global industrial system must be radically transformed into one that is environmentally sustainable. Sustainability will require an energy transmission transition that places non-polluting clean energy technologies at the fore. It moves us from the dependence on finite fossil and nuclear fuels and favors infinite sources of fuel, the renewable fuels that originate basically from the sun. Now, building a sustainable industrial system also requires better agricultural practices, stronger energy efficiency measures, higher quality water infrastructure, technologies for recyclable materials, and advanced waste management. And in respect of the latter, I, I just want to share something I feel very strongly about myself, and that is that, you know, any time I go out to cycle around, as I do quite often, the byways of North County Dublin, I'm really appalled by the extent to which the ditches and the culverts and the gateways of fields are clogged up with illegally dumped waste. And it's, it's really would make you despair at times, and raises a serious question about how people feel about these things that they go on in this particular way. But in any event, I think the whole idea of a green industrial revolution has to transform existing economic sectors and create new ones. That's the basic premise. And it's a direction that continues without a clear stopping point, but with a kind of a growing public benefit, actually in the form of having a, a planet that will not be destroyed. And closely tied to the concept of a green revolution is the problem of climate change. Climate change is a global environmental crisis that actually impacts all of us and which is the direct result of current centers of major economic activity. Climate change is driven by the emission of greenhouse gases and the majority of these gases are byproducts of the dominant energy production systems, whether it's uh, by coal, increasingly natural gas, by oil or whatever, but those systems that drive modern economies. And it's important to realize, I think, that we simply don't have a choice but to act, and to act decisively in this matter. I think it has reached that stage. And we know that the science is unequivocal. Without urgent and ambitious action, we will face temperature rises of four degrees centigrade or more this century, and irreversible changes in our climate. Climate catastrophes and extreme weather cyclones, tsunamis, floods, droughts, fires, melting glaciers, seasonal changes, threats to agriculture and much more are increasing. And indeed, we've seen evidence of this actually in the past few days in terms of the destructive events which have hit the Pacific Islands. And even in Ireland, like last winter, uh, unprecedented damage was done to many locations from coastal storms and coastal erosion is now becoming some serious problem uh, for us. 
But this pales into insignificance in comparison to the risks to sub-Saharan Africa. By 2080, between 65 and 100% of land which is currently used for coffee production uh, will become unsustainable for that purpose. And by 2050, 3% of Africa's land will no longer be able to, graze, to grow maize. In Uganda alone, for instance, the importance of this can be judged by the fact that coffee exports represent 30% of foreign currency earnings. And if you take a, a country like Malawi, which is a country I've been in many, many times, the impact of climate change are manifested in various ways. Increased uh, and more intense rainfall, uh, changing patterns of rainfall, floods, droughts, and prolonged dry spells. And the latest episode there led to more than 100,000 people uh, being displaced, which is confirming that, that very sad trend. Now, it is still possible to avoid surpassing that 2% threshold that most scientists seem to agree on, which is critical to the future sustainability. Possible for a few years, but after that, the window will close, and the opportunity to maintain global warming on any kind of manageable scale uh, will be gone. And the solutions are known. They include massive investment in renewables and clean technologies, getting the best we can out of efficient uh, energy use, transforming agriculture, and protecting forests. Now, it sounds simple, but of course it really isn't. I mean, effecting a transition to a new type of economy involves very difficult trade-off and choices. And take, for example, uh, the position of a country like Poland. That country has 100,000 people working in the coal mines and it's an unsustainable industry. But I doubt if anybody here, you know, would suggest that the Polish government should adopt the same type of approach as Maggie Thatcher did, say, with the mines in, in Britain. And finding, the point is that finding the means to adjust transition to a new type of economy, as called for by the international trade union movement, is, I think, a moral, economic, and a political imperative. Now, can a just transition actually be accomplished, though? Well, I think the way to look at this question is from the perspective of creating institutions that manage change. You know, after all, industrial restructuring is not a new phenomenon. It's more than 60 years since the Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter coined the phrase creative destruction to describe how capitalism as a system evolves. Technological developments will, in any event, bring their own challenges. You know, consider the possibility, which is current, say, of the driverless car. That seems now like a real prospect. It'd be hugely disruptive. Immediately, you can see that would bring an end, for instance, to occupations like bus drivers and taxi drivers and even uh, traffic police and people like that. But it would doubtless also save lives and reduce insurance costs and transform energy efficiency. So viewed in the broader context, the challenge of transitioning to a low carbon economy is in principle not hugely different to managing technological change uh, generally, and particularly those disruptive forms that I have just described. So managing a just transition uh, as advanced by the uh, ITUC requires us first, I think, to build into our economic system institutions with the capacity to kind of handle that type of change. Now, Industrial destruction and its social consequences is a huge issue. No one can deny that. But it can be managed, I think, with the right will and right approach. And simply put, I think it means that markets must be embedded in society and not the other way around, as they currently seem to be. And this is the core thesis of the great Hungarian-born political economist Karl Polanyi, who wrote an impressive critique of liberalism in 1944, which he called the Great Transformation, and which still influences progressive thinkers uh, of today, like Mariana Mazzucato, whom I mentioned earlier. But frankly, though, I am worried about the current state of democratic capitalism in the world. Now, a discussion on this topic needs much more time than we have available tonight. But suffice it to say that there used to be a widely shared consensus, certainly between the end of World War II and the 1980s, that for capitalism to be compatible with democracy, it had to be subjected to extensive political control so as to protect democracy from having to be restrained in the name of free markets. And as the years since 2008 have revealed, since the financial crisis hit us then, markets are increasingly dictating the terms under which governments may govern. 
In other words, political economy has been subordinated to a particular form of market-driven economics. As the French economist Thomas Piketty uh, and others have suggested, uh, this is leading to an unsustainable level of inequality in society, another type of, of uh, unsustainability. And the paradox here is that markets will not drive the transformation to a low carbon economy because they have no concern fundamentally with public goods. It's a project which has to be state led. But in the new dispensation we are facing since 2008, the difficult question is whether governments will be allowed the policy space by the markets to do what they need to do. And on empirical evidence, one has to be a little bit pessimistic on that point. But in the end, like so many other things, this boils down to a conflict of ideas, a conflict between the idea of maximizing shareholder value at all costs and the idea of certain public goods. And ironically, for everybody's sake, the public interest has to prevail on this occasion. You know, perhaps the secret lies in a less orthodox way of looking at economics and the public interest. A few days before he was assassinated, almost 50 years ago actually, Bobby Kennedy made a remarkable speech on the economy and society in the University of Kansas. And he was speaking at that time about what he had encountered as poverty in the United States. But the theme is consistent. What he was addressing was, how do we judge well-being? You know, we tend to judge it by the growth in the economy. But he was trying to say, this is not all. This is not the most important thing. It is not the be all and end all of everything. And these were the words he spoke, and I think they're very eloquent and still relevant. He said, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And I spoke earlier about my concern for the kind of world we are bequeathing to our children and our grandchildren. The debate of climate change we are now trying to initiate here tonight, I think, is very important in that context. Because over the years, Kennedy's words do resonate somewhat, I would say, with the challenge that we're trying to get the grips with. But I would like to end, if I can, on a kind of an optimistic note. You know, in 1930, when John Maynard Keynes wrote that famous essay of his entitled Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, he wildly predicted, as it seems at the time, that in 100 years, living standards would be four to eight times higher than they were at the time. And everybody thought he was crazy and mad. But actually, he was vindicated. That's the way it turned out. And this is really about ideas and the choices that flow from them. And our idea, I think, friends, really is this, in its most simple terms, that there is a better, fairer way to organize the economy and society. The key is to try to minimize the losses and to maximize the possibilities. And ideas do catch on in time. You know, the fastest selling luxury car in the United States, for example, at the moment, is the battery powered Telsa car that is transforming consumers' notion about what a car should be. And today also we read in our newspapers that the International Energy Agency is reporting that 2014 was the first time in 40 years in which there was a halt or a reduction in the emissions of greenhouse gases that was not tied to an economic downturn. Now, this is not a, a, an excuse for complacency, you understand, but perhaps a reason for hope, all the same. And Keynes himself famously said on one occasion, it's ideas that are dangerous, for good or ill, and hopefully tonight we will begin to start the process of getting people to think about different ideas. Thanks very much.